Well, I'm Darwin Anderson, a professor of soil science at the University of Saskatchewan, and we're here today at the uh, St. Denis National Wildlife Site to look at the soils of the grasslands, and particularly the Chernozemic soils. Chernozemic soils, they do occur in the grassland and in the adjacent Aspen Parkland. At this particular site, we're just sort of at the boundary between the Aspen Parkland and the moist mixed grassland, or you might say the boundary between where we first have some trees and, and the open prairie that used to be here a uh, hundred years ago. Had we been here about a hundred or 150 years ago, chances are this would have been a fescue prairie and there were probably be, would have been fewer aspen, as you see, growing in some of the lower areas. And the reason for that is the aspen in the, the growth of aspen increased a lot with the control of fires that came with the settling of this land about 1900. So there's more aspen here probably than there were than there was a few hundred years ago. In terms of this site, in <coughs> geologically, uh, we call landscape like this uh, a hummocky glacial uh, moraine or a hummocky till plain, and we call it hummocky because it has this great variety of of, of, of slope positions. There, there's the sharp knolls. Uh, sometimes called uh, knobs, in, in, if you're talking knob and kettle topography, and of course the fairly deep depressions where we have the uh, uh, much different kinds of soils. The geological material, or the soil parent material at this site, is, is glacial till. That means it's material that was deposited directly from the melting glacier. More or less the, the, the deposits were just let down on the surface of, of the ground. And because there's been little sorting, we, uh, glacial till tends to be what we call medium textured, somewhere between a sandy loam and a clay loam. That means that there's approximately equal amounts of sand, silt, and clay particles in the soil. Plus, of course, because it is a glacial till, we have the, the, the small boulders and stones, which are typical of glacial till. Well, because we are here just at the boundary between the, uh, the moist mixed grassland and the, and the aspen parkland, we're right in this boundary between a semi-arid climate and what we call a subhuman, mainly it's between a climate that's fairly dry and a climate that's just a bit more moist. The uh, annual precipitation in this area is about 400 millimeters. About two-thirds of it comes as rain, uh, mostly during the early part of the growing season. And of course, that's one of the reasons that this, this land grows as well as it does. Uh, the uh, <coughs> other aspects of the climate, of course, it's uh, we have a long time when the soil is frozen, and, uh, and sometimes in our soils we see evidence of that, although not in this particular profile. And, of course, uh, there are times when the soil is terribly dry. So it's, 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 it's a climate that has quite a lot of contrasts in terms of the, of the conditions that the soil is undergoing. Well, the soil here is the soil that's typical of the grasslands. So that's a Chernozemic order soil. And the characteristic feature of a Chernozemic order soil uh, that feature that makes it a Chernozem is the, is the dark colored AH horizon that we see here. But of course, uh, before we get that far and talk about the horizons, we should say something about the soil forming factors and the kind of processes that have occurred in the soil. Of course, this is a grassland uh, in a fairly dry climate, but uh, with, with times when the soil, of course, is moist and, and water does move right through the soil or, or leach the soil. And so when we think about uh, the basic processes of soil formation, one of the first ones we think of is removals, and that's materials that were once in the parent material and are gradually removed from the parent material, and actually the constituents were probably leached away into the subsoil and perhaps even into the groundwater. And one of the, th the, the constituents that comes to mind when we think of removals is our salts, soluble salts, both those that were in the soil and soluble salts that might form as weathering products of some of the reactions in the, in the soil. These are fairly quickly leached beyond the root zone, so we can consider, consider that is one constituent that has been re removed. Another basic process of soil formation is our processes of addition, materials that have been added to the soil. And it's in this particular situation, uh, the, the main constituent that has been added to the soil is organic matter. And organic matter is made up mainly of carbon, but it also includes nitrogen. And so the two kind of key components that has made this a soil uh, and have been added, and of course the reason organic matter is added to the soil is after plants or during plants growing on the soil, it's the residues from the plants that are the, you might say, the parent material or the feedstock for the organic matter. And in this case, we, we have a grassland vegetation so or, and organic matter. The addition of that organic matter to the soil, mainly from the, uh, the, the decaying roots of the grassy vegetation, has resulted in quite a lot of accumulation or the addition of quite a lot of organic matter 
to the uh, to this particular soil. So the carbon part that's important because that gives uh, a certain structure and so forth to the soil. But equally important are <coughs> or is uh, is nitrogen. Most of the parent materials have very little nitrogen in them, and so almost all the nitrogen that this ecosystem depends upon has been added from uh, from the atmosphere in two ways: directly from the atmosphere. Uh, during lightning storms and so forth, there's small additions, but more so and more important, either by micro microbial processes or microbial processes in association with, with a certain group of plants called legumes. So the addition of nitrogen to this soil uh, is a really important, uh, important soil farming factor and one of the reasons that the soil was able to, sus to su sustain an ecosystem, and the, the nutrients that came into the soil, the nitrogen that came into the soil from the atmosphere. The other two basic kinds of soil uh, forming uh, processes are transformations and translocations. And maybe I'll say just a bit about translocations first. In this soil, in contrast to the, uh, the other soil that's in this landscape, the humic alluvic glycol, there really aren't many, uh, the, the processes of translocation are not strong. There has been some weathering and leaching or a downward movement of, of calcium carbonate from the upper part of the soil down into the subsoil as we'll see later, uh, but uh, almost uh, none or very little uh, translocation of constituents like clay, which are usually uh, translocated in a, in a soil in a much stronger uh, soil farming environment, you might say. In terms of transformations, materials changing from one form to another, once again, this is a not really a strong soil forming environment, and so we don't have a great deal of transformations as would be typical of perhaps a, a soil in the forest region or in comparison to soil of tropical regions, m much less transformations. But some of the things that do transform, for example, most of the phosphorus that this ecosystem depends upon was present in the parent material as a mineral called apatite, a calcium phosphate mineral. Well, over the course of soil formation, uh, most of the of the phosphorus remaining in the soil is no longer as apatite. It's there because some of the phosphorus ions were taken up by the plants and became part of the organic matter. Some of it's in the organic form. And other uh, phosphorus that probably was also released by weathering is often tied up in complexes with, with iron and aluminum. So we see quite a lot of, of differences in transformation of phosphorus from the mineral appetite to a whole variety of forms. And, 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 and quite fortunately to a variety of forms that remain in the soil and continue to sustain this eco ecosystem. So I'll mention phosphorus. Another one we could mention when we're talking transformations is organic matter or the transformation that takes um, plant residues like we see being added to the soil and within the soil especially if we're dealing with root roots these materials are transformed into the dark colored uh, sort of mysterious material that we call humus and it's the humus that stays in the soil for quite a long period of time of the order of, of, of decades and hundreds of years and so the transformation of organic residues to humus is another example of transformations. When we're considering a soil profile like we have here today, it's really convenient to uh, to consider the different factors that have con that have contributed to or caused this particular kind of soil, and we call those the soil forming factors. And when we look at this particular soil in this landscape, I've already mentioned that the parent material, which is one of the soil forming factors, is a glacial till. That means that that glacial till was deposited, uh, deglaciation in this area was somewhere in the order of 10 to 12,000 years ago. So that puts the time dimension, which is another soil forma forming factor, on this particular site. So we've had a glacial till parent material and a soil that's probably existed for about 10,000 years. The, uh, another soil forming factor, of course, is organisms or vegetation. We've already mentioned that this particular area was a grassland. It seems to be, uh, there were, certainly was a time just after deglaciation when there may have been a spruce woodland here, but for the great majority of its time, it appears to have been a grassland. In terms of topography, well, this profile, as we'll talk about later, is a Northic or typical soil. And actually, although we're on a little bit of a, a bench and even a, in a bit of a runway here, it's a fairly level area in terms of the actual microsite. So there aren't a lot of topographical factors that have influenced the soil, and that's probably one of the reasons we see typical soil here. It's not too thin because it's on a, on a, on a slope or on a knoll. It's not over thickened because it's in a lower part of the landscape. A very typical soil where topography is not a huge factor uh, of soil formation. Uh, in terms of um, the, uh, 
Another factor, uh, and we often today, because most of our landscapes are cultivated, think of this, think of the influence of, of humans, of man on the soil. This soil certainly was cultivated for a period of time, and we see evidence of that in the fact that the the A horizon has a very sharp lower boundary, as we'll talk about later. Uh, that, that certainly influenced the soil. There may have been some changes, like phosphorus fertilizer added, what might change the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the nutrient status or the fertility of the soil. But generally, uh, except for the fact that the soil has been tilled, we don't see a, a, a huge impact of, of man on this particular soil. Well, now we're going to... Uh, Look at the pit, take a little more detailed look at the soil profile and the different horizons that make up the soil profile. Uh, this particular profile, we can see that one of the main differences that makes for soil horizons are the different colors of the soil. They show up reasonably well. And so in this particular soil, we have a dark colored surface horizon uh, that goes down to about that depth. Uh, this particular horizon, in this case, we would call an A horizon. It's the uppermost mineral horizon, so that's pretty well always called the A horizon. Because it has organic matter in it, uh, we might, it is, in a sense, an AH horizon. But I've already mentioned that it has a very sharp lower boundary, and we call AH horizons that have been plowed or cultivated, we call them AP horizons. So the upper horizon is an AP. And then we see a brown layer that extends from about this depth, gradually getting... Uh, uh, becoming a little more yellow, I guess you might say grayish yellow with depth. And I think down to about uh, approximately 30 centimeters depth, the strongest expression of the of the reddish brown the color occurs. And this is a B horizon. Because it is a B horizon that has a strong expression of a different color and to some degree structure, but no other uh, special feature such as an accumulation of clay or, or, or glaying or any other feature, uh, we use the term for this, it's a BM horizon. I think the M sort of stands for modified or something like that. It's, 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 it's a horizon that's been changed, but doesn't have a lot of special, uh, you know, other features. And then in this soil, it's, it's kind of interesting because quite often right under the B horizon, we have a horizon that we call a CCA, where there's been a gain in carbonate. But in this particular soil, there's, an, there's a depth from about, um, of about 10 centimeters, which is sort of transitional between the reddish B and, and, the, and the parent material below. And this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, conventions we use is for a transitional horizon like that, is simply to use the two uh, master horizons and, and call it a BC. It's basically transitional from the B to the C horizon. And if we use the, the dilute hydrochloric acid on this particular horizon, or a particular profile, we'll see that in the upper part, the HCl doesn't effervesce; it doesn't uh, it doesn't fizz. In this reddish B horizon, it doesn't fizz again. Although down in here, we do start to get some carbonate pebbles pebbles that will fizz. But even in this transitional horizon, the degree of effervescence is it's very slight. And then actually, when we get to the to the CCA horizon, which is characterized by having a gain in calcium carbonate or a lot of calcium carbonate in the soil, we're expecting the soil to really fizz. And so when we spray the acid on this particular horizon, it, it really fizzes. That means that there's a high concentration of calcium carbonate in that particular horizon. We're here today to look at, a, a you might say, a northern example of a Chernozem soil. Uh, the soil we looked at earlier, the dark brown Chernozem, was definitely in the, um, just at the, at the boundary of the uh, of the moist mixed grassland in the Aspen Parkland, and here we're in where the Aspen Parkland uh, basically uh, merges in with the continuous Aspen forest to the north. And we've come about 75 kilometers north, and we've probably increased our elevation by about 100 meters, and so we're in a, a cooler uh, and more humid, a more moist environment. And because of that, we have a soil that uh, has somewhat deeper horizons. And, uh, and interestingly enough, is a soil that we call a dark gray chernozem. That means it's a, in a soil that occurs in this transitional area between the grasslands and, and, the, and the forest ecosystems. If we look a little more carefully at the soil, you'll see that we have, uh, from about 30 centimeters up, a, a very, quite a thick, I guess I should call it an AP horizon, because I'm going to mention later this very prominent and sharp boundary at the bottom part of the A horizon. 
So we have an AP horizon which is about 30 centimeters thick. That is actually a little thicker than we were expecting and probably because on the upper part here there's evidently been the deposition of some wind blown dust and I'm saying from the cultivated fields in this area. Boundary. But the normally we would expect this A horizon to be about 15 or 20 centimeters thick, somewhat deeper years, than we had in the Arctic Dark Turnazan. So we have, a, uh, as I mentioned, uh, at the lower part of the A, about 30 centimeters there's quite thick. a pronounced uh, much thicker uh, line, than we were indicating that this soil was some probably once plowed, wind -blown dust maybe on many, many years ago, several Below decades ago, probably. P horizon but hasn't been plowed. It uh, certainly hasn't been cultivated since that time. So we have an AP horizon that goes from zero to 30 centimeters. From about 30 centimeters down to about 45, you'll notice the the brownish colored B horizon. I'm going to designate it as a BM horizon because I don't see any evidence other than the color, the, the brownish color, and to some degree the structure uh, that indicate that it, it, there's no indications that this is a BT horizon or a more strongly uh, developed kind of, of, of horizon that we'll be seeing later on in, in, in the gray Luvasol soil that we, we examine. So the B horizons Play from about or, uh, 30 would, to about 45, to, almost 50 centimeters in some places. Horizon. The lower the part of the B, you notice once again, there seems to be a, a little bit of a concentration of, um, of pebbles, but that's sort of what we expect when we're dealing with a, a glacial till soil, that there will be that kind of a feature now and then. And then we move into the down and into the into the sea horizon or the parent material, sand, silt, uh, and clay. And this is a glacial it's till. Probably about a, a There's sandy clay a boulder, a small boulder right there. And of course, it is this material that's approximately uh, a clay loam texture. It's a, made up of a, a mixture, a approximately equal uh, mixture of sand, silt, and clay particles, along with the, along with the, uh, the sto stones and boulders that make it a glacial till. So this is, uh, if we do the soil colors, which are, once again, the great groups within the Trinizamic order, the decision about their classification is based on soil color. So if we take a sample of this A um, horizon, uh, and I'm taking the sample here two, where I think it was the original A horizon, soil, not material that might have been blown in. And if we use our soil color chart, it comes out to be, uh, um, even the moist color, about t uh, 10YR, uh, 4.5 over 2 or 4 over 2 which means that it's a a dark gray, a dark gray turnizem soil. So the great group here is dark gray turnizem because we also have the B horizon it's a typical or ordinary dark gray turnizem so we would call this an orthic dark gray turnizem soil.